Um, I work for Gregus Vodka. I'm the North American ambassador for Gregus Vodka. Uh, but luckily for you, we're not here to talk about Gregus Vodka this morning. Um, <laughs> but we've got, um, I think, an interesting seminar. I'll give you a bit more background. I put a little slide which, if you have attended um, some seminar already, you probably have seen before, just giving the, the official hashtag uh, and talking about what could be interesting for you if you haven't had it yet, um, which is the Wi-Fi password. Um, but otherwise, that's also not what we're talking about this morning. Um, the idea of this seminar actually came uh, because I've been traveling around quite a fair bit um, during my career in, the hospi in hospitality and in this industry. And um, I just came one day to a realization. Um, I was actually looking for an idea um, to, to do a seminar or to do a talk. And while traveling, I realized that in most of the cities I was visiting around the world, specifically big uh, cocktail cities, the guys who were running some of the best programs in these cities were actually not from the city, nor from the country. Um, so I thought it was quite an interesting, um, an interesting thing to explore on you know, why that was the case, how did this happen, and who were those people and how did they move actually. Um, so we've got today an in incredible panel, um, and I'm not talking about myself, don't worry, I'm French, but you won't have too much of the French <laughs> attitude coming through. Um, I'm gonna let those guys like, explain a little bit more about what they do. If you want the hashtags for the seminar, Movers and Shakers, and obviously uh, Tales of the Cocktail 2017, if you want to post on social media, our sponsor, is Grey Goose, that's very surprising, I'm sure, to most of you. Uh, but they were very generous to make this happen. And then, um, obviously, this is something that um, I felt really um, strongly about. I really wanted to be able to kind of put together a panel that would represent a little bit of um, this idea that was behind. Um, so I will give you a little bit of my background beforehand, but I'm gonna let those gentlemen introduce themselves. Ago, do you want to kickstart the presentation? <laughs> Hello, how are you? Buongiorno. Ago Perrone, I work in uh, London since uh, 14 years. Uh, moved uh, for uh, personal challenges. My plan to move it wasn't really to follow the dream to be the best bartender in the world, as many of you in this room. It was because I follow my, my mentor, at the time a mentor uh, dream. I didn't speak any English, and Simone told me, Ago, let's go to London. It's amazing. Hey, well, Simone, it's okay. I follow you. you know, if, I'm under your wings. So we went to London. After two weeks, uh, Simone went back to Italy to sort it out some stuff. And then he called me and said, Ago, I'm coming back. I said, good. <laughs> now now, now start to be interesting. I didn't speak any English, so I threw myself into, into the cold water and uh, tried, to, I tried to make uh, things happening as uh, I was seeing. And uh, well, my latest job is at the Connaught uh, for the past nine years. And I'm very proud to be here representing the international bartender community and sharing with you our passion, our stories and uh, get inspired to each other. Thank you, Ago. And just, it's a perfect thing for me, actually, because that's what one of the first, it's a good introduction. Um, first time I actually went to London, I was visiting some friends over there. Uh, I started bartending in Paris uh, many, many years ago. And uh, at that time, I'm talking about before the cocktail scene was actually what it is nowadays. Um, it was only like kind of old classic cocktail bars and hotel bars. So obviously that was a very, very different style. First time I went to London, I actually um, was amazed um, of the level and the difference in levels that there was. And the f one of the first bar I actually walked into uh, was a bar called Montgomery Place. And the people who were behind the bar, when one of the two bartenders who was behind the bar he, that night is actually sitting there. Yeah, I was more <laughs> looking like uh, Julian. Exactly. With a beard, uh, yellow braces, uh, piercing. <laughs> so for me, the challenge to go to the hotel was to change my look, really. I had to shave every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was that, so that's incredible to be able to kind of carry on this as well uh, throughout. And you know, in this industry, that's definitely what happened um, very often. I'm going to introduce you now to, to Chris Lauda and let him introduce himself. Hello. Actually. 
Uh, thank you. Thanks, Julian, for putting all this together and uh, Winter Wheat for sponsoring. Uh, and to the CAPS, thanks for all of your hard work. Let's hear it for them. Get blood moving. It's, it's, it's early morning, one of the last days of tales. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, my name is Chris Lauder. I am a spirits evangelist in Shanghai, China. What does that mean? Uh, so I work for a, <laughs> well, that's a very liberal uh, job title. We made it up. Um, so I work for a company called Proof and & Company, and we are a group that's based out of Singapore. We also have offices in Hong Kong. We do a lot of work in East Asia, and what we do primarily is, is educate bartenders, uh, train bartenders, help host events. We distribute craft spirits in uh, East Asia, so we help a lot of brands that want to break into the Asian market, whether it be Singapore, whether it be mainland China, which is my focus, uh, help them get traction on the ground. And then we also consult on a number of bar programs. So bars that we work on, uh, Manhattan Bar in Singapore, um, the newly opened Atlas, which fingers crossed is open uh, for some awards this year uh, due to all of their hard work. Um, also 28 Hong Kong Street in Singapore. And China is our new venture. So I've been in Asia now for five years, um, not all in a row. This is now going on my second year in this stretch. I lived in China and Japan for three years when I was a student and then later as a professional translator uh, for Mandarin and Japanese. So that's my degrees in East Asian studies. So I have a lot of background in that part of the world. But now I am very lucky and fortunate that I can go back to Asia um, with craft cocktails and with 10 years of F&B experience and, and train people there in that way uh, in, in that language that they get to use. So that's really exciting to do something with it, which my parents thought I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's exciting. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So we're, we're here to talk all about different experiences. Guys, uh, show of hands, how many are currently working abroad, like not in your home country? So some, some, how many are thinking that you're not working abroad, but you're kind of playing with the idea and that's why you're here? Awesome. Uh, there we go. I love that. So we've got a lot of information for you. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit and a lot of common mistakes that we all had coffee earlier and just had a little uh, session of what's the most important things to know. So a lot of exciting stuff for you guys to learn. So I'm happy you're here uh, and we can make that commitment to you. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Chris. Um, and yeah, again, I know it, well, a few things happened for the first time this morning. First of all, it's the first time I'm actually awake at 10 a.m. on a Saturday at Tales of the Cocktail. Uh, <laughs> it's also my first seminar, and you all seem to understand why I say so. It's quite a, I've won so far. Because um, there's a lot of different accents, so you need to bear with us. And um, I'm going to introduce you to the last person, um, obviously, on the panel, um, Nathan O'Neill. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself, actually. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. So I basically started off in a small place called Belfast, which is in the north of Ireland. I was very, very fortunate in the fact that one of the first couple of people that I met was um, Sean Muldoon and Jack McGarry, actually from the Dead Rabbit, uh, who gave me the opportunity to come and work for them at The Merchant. This kind of started off uh, a long path of not only travel, but also great connections, uh, including Tales of the Cocktail. From there, I decided that it was kind of the right time to move to London. Um, the boys had just recently gone off to New York, uh, and it was a good point for me to kind of like break away from everything that was happening in Belfast and kind of spread my wings a bit. So I moved over to start working in Milk and Honey, um, which was an amazing opportunity. From there, I then applied to be to join the Cocktail Apprentice program in New Orleans. So I was one of the first international caps actually uh, to ever actually be part of the program which over the last five years, four to five years, has kind of developed to the point now that I'm actually managing the program with them. Um, I actually met my current employee, Leah Robichek, uh, from the Nomad there, which over the course of the year started conversations. Uh, but during this actual point, I then was very fortunate as well uh, to work with Ryan Chetty Wadana and Ian Griffiths. We opened White Lion together, and then I worked on the actual overall beverage program for uh, Dandelion as well. So we opened three bars and a restaurant all in one go, uh, which was quite a big project considering that none of us had ever worked in a hotel before. We'd never consulted on one, um, and none of us really had that background. So to take on such a big project was really intriguing. Um, we were very fortunate to do really well the first year of Tales and won Best International New Bar, which um, was my last year there. Leo offered me the opportunity to come to New York. 
uh, having lived there previously like 10 years before, I knew that it was kind of the right move, but I was also ready to kind of move ahead uh, after being in London for a number of years and just kind of like go and see what a different side to the industry and a different culture was actually like. So since the last two years, I've actually been based out of the Nomad as the head bartender, um, helping to develop the beverage program, not only for the Nomad, but for 11 Madison Park, our sister restaurant as well. Uh, we're in the process of currently um, opening another three venues in the next year and a half uh, across the country and also in New York. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Agot, you want to give us a quick word on the drink we've got? I think everybody got it in front of them now. The cocktail that you are drinking now is called, uh, oops, I dropped I drop an olive. <laughs> <laughs> Killing it. <laughs> you, uh, you killed it. If you smell it, I mean, for sure you try. Oh, I, was, I was talking with the, with the glass and uh, drinking the microphone. <laughs> 10 a.m. It's quite strong drink, as you can see. <laughs> the inspiration came through um, a day when uh, Massimo Bottura, you know who is he? the world's famous uh, Italian chef. He's, uh, he's a great, uh, great chef. He's a fantastic person, super inspirational. And he was at a corner today when he launched his book. And uh, I knew there was uh, in the morning a photo shooting at the bar. So I told myself, okay, I sneak in, I go have a look. And uh, we started to play around the bar a little bit. He told me the stories of uh, one of his uh, famous uh, dish, which is, oops, I dropped the lemon tart. So the story goes like this one, that uh, they were one evening at the pass, and the waiter took the lemon tart from the pass, and then he dropped it. Everybody stopped. Say, oh, Marona, what's going on now? The chef going to get crazy. He stopped everybody. He said, wait. Look what have you done on the floor. And the guy went white. He almost fainted. Can you imagine? And then he went, you are a genius. <laughs> from now, from now, I want it. that we sell the lemon tart that looks exactly that one, They're like we drop it. And uh, I thought, wow, such an inspirational uh, point that uh, from a mistake that can happen in a daily routine without plan, you can really take uh, one uh, artistic aspect out of it and make it work for you and surprise your guest as well. So Opsa Drop and Olive came through some experiment as well we were, we were doing at the bar when we did the, the latest menu. And we were infusing a spirit with, um, with the Douglas fir, with pine, pine needles. Because we wanted to have this uh, piney flavor. So we infuse it for one hour, there's nothing. Two hours, there's nothing. Three hours, there's nothing. Went home. The day after, Giorgio came to me, one of my guys. He said, Ago, smell this one. Say, what the hell is that? Olive oil? It really smelled like, uh, like olive oil. And then I tasted it, and there was this uh, sweet, uh, bitter flavor with a viscosity like uh, olive oil. It was amazing. So I thought, wow, why we don't do something like a clear, dirty martini or a cocktail that uh, reminds us that one? So we started to work on the recipes, and uh, we ended up mixing uh, Grey Goose infused with uh, Douglas fir. Actually, today is made with, uh, with the real olive oil as well to give more strength with the Galliano L'Aperitivo, which is uh, one of the latest editions of the Galliano family, based on uh, alpine uh, uh, spices and herbs. So you have this kind of bitterness that uh, enhances the bitterness of the, of the olive oil. And there is a lot of citrus as well. The citrus enhanced with the Italicus, which is a rosolio di bergamotto, nice aromatic with gentian as well. So we used all uh, ingredients that were very similar to a vermouth, Kind of, but because the vermouth is low in ABV, in my opinion, if you want to pull out certain high flavor, you need to use something stronger. So if I was going to use the vodka infused with the, with the olive oil or the glass fur with the dry vermouth, maybe the body wasn't quite there. So we use uh, Galliano Aperitivo and Italicos, which are higher in ABV, so can lift all this, uh, all this flavor. Blend it together for... Uh, Something that uh, I think uh, the Cups did a great job here because uh, it really tasted close to what we have at the Connaught. So on the nose is a kind of uh, olive oil with some citrusiness. And on the palate, you should get a little bit of viscosity and this kind of uh, uh, elegant flavor and silky notes on the palate. And the opposite drop in olive is because, uh, as we said, 
It's like if you drop an olive into the glass and then it dissolves. As we use the liquors, you know what liquor means in Latin? Liquefare, transforming from solid to liquid. So there is a connection as well, that we drop an olive into the glass, it dissolves, the olive is not there, but it tastes like an olive. So this is a little bit the idea of, uh, of the cocktail. Thanks, Ago. Pleasure. That was a sorrow. Uh, information on the drink, but hope you enjoy this drink. Now we're going to dive into it. Um, really, the idea of the seminar was also to find out a few different uh, pieces of advice for you to take away. And actually, if you wanted to make a move, you could definitely use to kind of guide yourself. So the first idea was to look at, you know, four different points. Why, where, how, and what, you know? Um, why would you move? Um, and there is a few reasons that we could uh, look into for this. So why would you want to move? Um, for example, in my own personal story, I know that when I was working in Paris, starting to bartend, uh, cocktail bartending was not that spread out as it is nowadays. So the idea was really for me, the first time I went to London and I saw what you know, the industry was all about over there, like the level of bartending and difference there was, um, I just knew that it needed to be my next step if I wanted to do something in this industry. So I had the chance uh, and the opportunity to make a move very easily, which might not be the case anymore, uh, as you probably have heard of something called Brexit. Um, but at the, time, <laughs> at the time, I basically went um, to London for a week to stay with some friends. I wasn't having a great time at home. I was a bit, of, I was a bit lost and I didn't know what my next step could be. Um, so when I went to London, spent a week with my friends, loved it, visiting so many bars. So I just went back, gave my notice, took my bags, took the Eurostar and left. Um, this was, you know, I was like 20 something. Uh, I was kind of eager to learn more things. I didn't care sleeping on the floor because basically that's what happened for about three months. Uh, I arrived in London. There were seven of us in a room for three people. Uh, so, so it was the first, the first person who was coming back home was basically getting the bed. Uh, we all had different schedules. <laughs> we had all had different schedules. Uh, I slept on the floor so many nights. But at the same time, I was very, very lucky um, to meet a couple of very, very uh, important people later on. I didn't know um, anyone, uh, but I started, uh, it took me a, a few days, well, I didn't really speak English either, but it took me a few days to kind of look into the different websites where you could find uh, a job like, you know, Craigslist or like the different um, job that they were, I don't remember, Gumtree was the other one that was uh, at the time in London, I don't know if it still exists or not. Um, but, so I looked into it, went for a couple of interviews, and actually the second interview, I found a job straight away and I thought the guy would, um, would make me a bar back because I didn't speak English very well. But I had a good knowledge um, in spirits and everything, so I actually managed to get, like, um, to get a proper bartending job. But really the idea um, of it was for me to kind of get better. Um, but sometimes, depending on where you are, you kind of reach a level and you kind of become maybe what we could call a big fish in a small pond rather than uh, you know, being a small fish in a, in a big pond, you know, which can happen sometimes in cities like when you start working in London, you start working in New York, where there is a lot of competition, and sometimes the other move is to move maybe in a smaller city to kind of um, establish your image in a different way. But I'm going to kick start with you again, Ago. Um, oh, so you explained to us, you followed Simone uh, in London. Was there like, what was the thinking behind it, and what was your objective, really? Well, my objective was uh, try to... But I think that uh, you need to look in, uh, you need to have uh, two web pages. One is the professional aspect of it, so what you want to achieve, or what you think is good for you at the moment, because you need to be flexible at, uh, and uh, changing plan. And the other aspect is the life, uh, life experience. So really what I was looking when I moved to London, I think it was, uh, it was a good balance of the two. I know there were a few key bars in London that were the, the leading uh, places at the moment, like uh, Lab and uh, Milk and Honey. They were the, the two most uh, uh, famous bars at the moment. But also I was excited as well to, to see a new culture, that it wasn't the British culture only, luckily. Um, but it was a multicultural experience, working and living with people from uh, different parts of the world, from different countries. So you lived with them, you had breakfast with them, are you already learning something? And that for me was, was super exciting the, the first two weeks. Uh, the challenge came when uh, we opened uh, the bar 
uh, they're supposed to open with Simone, who speak the English, I didn't. And uh, there, was, uh, there was no a system in the computer where you can place an order or something like that. Everything was on the phone. So you pick up the phone, you leave either a voicemail or you speak with the, with the, with the other side and you place your order. So you don't speak English, you think your order is something, and then you get something else. And then when the frustration come through, really. Well and for me, <laughs> buongiorno. And for being Italian, uh, from Alf from Saudi Italy, kind of fiery, you know. So this was, the frustration came through quite a few times a day because uh, I wanted to order a certain item that I even didn't know because they were not available in Italy. Uh, but I, I was, uh, I was uh, observing what other bartenders were doing at the bars in London, so I was getting inspired by them. And I was trying to, to, you know, to adapt myself, my knowledge, into a new world, into an expectation that, uh, that uh, it was overwhelming under certain aspects. So we opened the bar, the first thing that was told was, Ago, here in London, the drink is very important, but if you don't talk to people, you don't create the atmosphere. I said, bloody hell, even more difficult. <laughs> you know, even more difficult because I don't speak English properly, so how am I going to do now? It was not easy. It was not easy a uh, few months in the beginning, but uh, you know, with a smile, with a good attitude, uh, I went through things. And uh, as Julian has slept uh, with friends on the couch for a few times, it's all part of the training. That's why you need to be flexible in the beginning, because you need a flexible flex uh, <laughs> flex <laughs> back as well to. Uh, you know. <laughs> Definitely, and I think you know that's that's obviously when you move. You are different time in your life, probably. Um, I think Ago um, and I, we probably made the move like slightly earlier in your life, when in our life, when we could sleep on the floor. I don't think now. I mean, I, now I'm sure I don't sleep now on the floor. I start <laughs> <la> <laughs> now only if I start luxury. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you know, it's it's very complicated. But again. Um, even if you don't speak the language, there is ways around it. And, um, and obviously, there is another good example of not speaking the language the first time they move somewhere. And uh, Chris, you might be the person taking over on this one. Fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'd say, I mean, there's two times. It, one thing that's important to say is that moving abroad, um, just like you're saying now, it doesn't have to necessarily mean tackling all of the difficulty of a foreign country. I think the first time that I moved abroad for work beyond translating was certainly moving to New York City um, from Philadelphia because in, in Philadelphia I had four years of cooking experience. I wanted to get into cocktails. Uh, I went to a bartender school, um, which I don't... <laughs> which I learned how to make an awesome three count orange water into a two count green water shaken for three seconds into a stacked up uh, shot glass situation. I can still do it today, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say, fair enough. Um, but moving to New York, it's the same deal. You're moving to a major city, look, I mean, you're, it's a fish out of water situation just like the slide says. And I made a decision early on that if I, I'm not in, halfway kind of person. I, if I do something, I, I really want to do it all the way. And so for cocktails, it was the same deal for me. There was only one decision, which is if I want to have a remarkable life, I have to do remarkable things, um, is just a, a fact of the matter. And so I, I wanted to move to New York. Um, got a job on Craigslist also for Dave Arnold, randomly, who was recruiting on Craigslist. Uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, <laughs> And, and moved up to New York, and I stayed in an air mattress that had a hole in it um, with a friend of mine I used to do improv comedy with who moved to New York uh, up in Queens. That's it. And um, he had an air mattress with a hole in it that I could stay in for a little while, and he had a cat that was not well. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and every day, you know, I'd, I'd work at, uh, at Booker and Dax from 5 to 5, and I'd come back on the, the early morning train, and... Um, be on that air mattress that was inflated at the start of the night, and by the end of the night, you're in a deep, deep situation. Uh, <laughs> and so anyway, that's, hey, that's that. You've got to be flexible. You've got to do what you've got to do. And uh, personally, at least in the very beginning, learning a craft, uh, starting from square one, I'd rather be nobody somewhere than, than somebody nowhere. And uh, that was the decision I made ultimately to, deep, right? Uh, that was the decision I ultimately made to, to move up to New York. Uh, aside from that, look, moving to Asia, 
now I can I can speak the language, so I'm happy about that. Um, and and you know I, I have a, a really supportive wife who's there with me, Michaela, who's amazing. She covers 14 countries. Like between the two of us, you know, she's everywhere from Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, to Indonesia, to Australia is is kind of English. Uh, and and um, <laughs> that's that's for you. Thanks. <laughs> um, and, and so we travel around like that. Look, it, you've got you've to make a decision of something you want to do, and you've got to have an end goal. Um, life is too crazy to not have a clear direction of where you're going. Um, if you're not writing your own script, then you're a character in somebody else's script that they're writing for you. So, so you just have to make sure that you've got a clear goal um, and just go from there. And I'm grateful for it. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges along the way, but now I'm in a position where it, originally, I moved to New York to learn. I moved to Asia. I, I was working at the Nomad Hotel also, managing those bars. And I realized that there was a whole world I wanted to contribute to. And um, knowing friends in Asia who really, they said, look, like we've got so many hungry bartenders. There's guests out here. They love the experience. Craft cocktails are exploding. It, there's a lot you can share. And I, I knew they were right. And so at the end of the day, I, I contacted a friend of mine who works for Proof & Company. I moved to Seoul, South Korea to open that Four Seasons for Charles H. Bar, which now Lorenzo uh, Antinori is, is amazingly head bartending. Um, and now I'm doing the same thing in, in China, and it's really inspiring to me, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Can I ask something? That's, nobody wants to make a mistake in life. Yes. But it's not possible. So be ready to that one. Be ready to, to try different experiences, different style of bar, until you find what is more suitable for you. And also, be really open-minded, because uh, well, Chris is a, is a clear example. Bar world is not being behind the bar making cocktail only. It's not being bar manager only. Give you so many opportunities. You can be brand manager, brand ambassador, you can make your own brand, you can be consultant for a spirits company, opening bars. So more mistakes you make, more you understand yourself yes. and you find what is more suitable for you. There are places for people and people for places. If the place is not for you, you got to realize it. Don't, don't try to be somebody else because the place is famous or because you think that's the best you, you can get out of it. You need to find time for yourself wherever you are in the world to really sit with yourself and, and feel what makes you happy. Because all of us, we are different. So it's very important now to switch off the phone, put them aside, and just uh, you know understand who you are and what you want to do. And uh, yeah, that's a great point. And I think it's it's part of establishing your, your objectives at the start. And it's not because you've established something and you want to reach this, but sometimes it's not possible that you've been failing. You know, it's all about like kind of recentering this objective. Mm. Like when I moved to London in the first place, I wanted to be the best bartender in the world. And for for those of you who know me, you know that I'm pretty fucking far from it. So <laughs> it's a, it's. You know, I kind of had to recenter this uh, because I saw a whole new world. So it was it was very interesting. But I learned and developed other skills um, that you know were kind of useful to me. And also, I kind of fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the country, which for a Frenchman is not something I talked a lot about. But uh, <laughs> but obviously, it's not. It's you know, it was it was very interesting. Like because you kind of found you find like. A, you know, kind of sides of your personality that you didn't know before, first of all, because, well, you don't understand what people are saying most of the time, um, and also because you have to try to, otherwise you better take the train back or the fly back home. Um, but again, establishing your objective is very, very important. And, and Nathan, how did you establish, because you moved to two of the biggest city in the world from already a city where you were working in one of the best bar in the world. Mine was actually funny, and Jacob just reminded me as well, something quite funny, like Chris might have moved to China, but me moving from Belfast to London, I may as well have been speaking a different language. <laughs> nobody, even today, still understands a word that I say. What's the crack? Yeah. Um, mine was kind of funny. I, at the time, my wife and I, but girlfriend then, um, we sat down for a meal, and I'd been to London the year before, and it was kind of like a shell shock. I got invited to come and do a trail at Milk and Honey. And I was blown away by how quick things were, the, the, the establishment, the culture, the way that things worked service-wise was completely like out of my depth. Um, and I was like, I'm not ready for this. So I took a fair of a year to kind of like re-establish what I wanted to do and learn the things that I needed to be able to go there and kind of succeed. 
Sat down for dinner with Hannah, and I was like, we're moving to London in two weeks. She's like, what? And I was like, we're going in two weeks. And um, she, at this point, wasn't going to go with me. Um, I was going over myself. We were going for a weekend. And luckily, she got offered a job to come and run the reservations for Milk and Honey whilst we were there. So in the space of two weeks, we'd made a decision we were going to go to London. Uh, the following day, we signed on an apartment, not really knowing at all the cost of apartments um, in London. For anybody that's actually been there, London's probably the, one of the most expensive cities, if not the most expensive city to live in. Uh, work through my first month in Milk and Honey, everything's going great, and then I get my paycheck. And my paycheck and Hannah's combined isn't even enough to cover half the rent. I'm all like, fuck, this is not good. Um, never mind trying to survive with food and just trying to travel. Uh, my next big like, objective was kind of just getting home at night. So you'd take the bus out of Soho, which was about 45 minutes to an hour from where I lived, and I'd like basically fall asleep on the upper deck of the bus, and before I know it, I've ended up in like Ilsford, which is about an hour and a half away, and I have to take the bus the whole way back. And we were finishing Milk and Honey at about four or five in the morning. Um, my objective was just to continue to learn. Um, I wanted to get an understanding of like why people moved to London. I had an amazing job when I was in Belfast. The merchant paid exceedingly well. I was super comfortable. I was in a head bartender position. I had a beautiful car, lovely apartment. I had utterly no reason to leave. Um, and then I reached a stage where I was like, okay, I can sit here and continue doing this, keep going where we're going, or I can actually go and try and find something new. Try and develop myself and just try and see what's going to happen in the future. And to be honest, just if it fails, it fails. And if it doesn't, then it, it succeeds. So by the time I got through the first year in London, things started to actually come together. Um, and I was very, very fortunate in that I'd met the right people and kind of got to the place that I need to get to. Um, but it wasn't without its challenges. As I say, like every single month was a struggle. I had to literally wake up in the morning time, study, go to work, come home, study. And it was just a case of trying to keep up with everybody else. Uh, the pace was so much faster. And it was the same whenever I got to New York. New York was such a culture difference because of the way the actual drinking culture is, uh, the way that they drink, the service standards. Everybody's been to the Culinary Institute in New York, or it seems to in America, studies there and goes straight into hospitality. In the UK, you don't kind of have that background where you have somebody who goes into a profession directly for hospitality. Um, in the UK and Europe, it's very much like a lot of people fall into it. Like, as Igo says, it's kind of you're looking somewhere new to go and you're just going to try something out. And usually hospitality is the thing you fall into simply because it's the easiest job to get an opportunity in. Um, whereas in the United States, I had all these people who previously had trained as chefs for like four years, knew every single detail about food, knew every detail about wine, and I had no clue. So I started at Nomad and basically went through every single position possible from bar back to kitchen server, kitchen server to AS, up to server. I worked with a prep team, I worked in the kitchen over about a form of rotation and not a single person in Nomad actually knew what position I was coming for, which was the funniest thing ever. So that was pretty much how it all began. And my objective was just to kind of keep learning everywhere that I've gone or the reasons that I've taken has just been to kind of find a new interest to challenge myself and also because I wanted to kind of like be able to give back to others and bring something different to a scene that necessarily uh, I haven't been a part of before. New York was just a great opportunity because after moving in London it was like the next significant step within, um, within the bar world. And, and again, that might sometimes sound oh, a little bit difficult to be making the move. Um, and again, it is difficult, but it's not impossible. And you can see on the panel, I think everybody, all those three guys, not me, um, are nominated for an award tonight, or one of the projects they've been working on at least, or the bar they work on. Um, so this is possible which is why we're here. Um, but again, the location that you're going to choose to move to is very, very important. Um, this is um, one of the key, really. And establishing this in the first place will be very, very important. So either you can move because that's what it feels like, or you're following someone, um, or you can move because you've got a passion about it, or really you kind of um, feel like you could make a difference there, which is a little bit what happened with sure. what you did when you moved. Um, but it's very, very important in the first place to do your research. Um, this is probably the big, big key um, into making sure you're going to be successful where you go. Um, I'm definitely not a good example at it, or I wasn't, uh, because the first time I moved to London, I just, as I said, I went back, put everything in my bag, moved, and slept on the floor for three, for three months, which is not something that you, if you're prepared and you've done your research, you necessarily have to do. Um, but you always should be looking at 
Um, is there a visa? Is there you know, something, and especially now... The cost it's of life as well. The yeah, cost yeah. of life was a great example. I think this is um, something now that is very important and, and with information that's very much easily accessible that was not necessarily beforehand. Um, but you know, we put together um, a few websites that you can um, take uh, inspiration from if you need to move. They are all filled with lots of information on visas, on how to apply, and on what to do. Um, this is something that can be very time consuming and very cost consuming as well. But again, as we said, the cost of life is going to be a very, very important into, um, into the way you're going to be able to, um, to kind of do this. But how did, how did you do when you moved? Please? I have so much to say about this topic. <laughs> I have so much to say. Okay, uh, so two stories. One about doing it wrong and one about doing it right. Um, which I think all of us have probably bruised our knees enough to know how to do it wrong. Um, and as you can hear from the stories, if ever, any of us were ever to move again, we'd probably have a much better uh, strategy for doing so. You're gonna blow it, is the first thing I wanna say. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the first thing I'm gonna say, but it's okay. Uh, you're going to land on your feet and you're going to learn a lot from the process of blowing it, but it's important to set you up yourself up with the fear-setting expectation of failure that you are going to blow it because this is a complicated thing. It, it depends on which country you move to, but anytime you expatriate or even just go uh, overseas um, to relocate for work, it's very complicated and challenging. There's going to be things that surprise you, and it's, it's better just to, to be realistic about that. Um, when I moved to Korea is probably the, the best example of doing it wrong, um, because I had an opportunity that came to fruition, and they said, look, like the hotel's opening, they're bearing down on a deadline, they're not going to, it's very rare that a hotel does not push their grand opening date, but this one actually did not push. They opened the day they said they would. Boy, should they have paused. Uh, but, but, but the fact of the matter is that I got an opportunity. Uh, I was in Cognac visiting uh, Maison Ferrand at the time and um, had a decision to make. And the decision that I made was that uh, I was in love and, and wanted this person that I was with to, to also be there in Korea. Um, and so we made the decision to get married. So we had, uh, we had 48 hours to pull the trigger and get hitched. Um, otherwise we wouldn't, yeah, that's right. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't have enough time to apply for the visas and then get to Korea on time, which we really barely squeaked it in. I had uh, 12 F&B outlets to open and six weeks to do so before the grand opening date, um, which is crazy town. Yeah. Um, so we got married and then moved to Seoul, South Korea, neither of us having ever been there. And it was such a fly by the seat of your pants kind of series of decisions that we knew was right and in hindsight was right, but was so stressful moving through. Um, important things to know is if you move just because your spouse has a spousal visa, can they work? Um, if they can work, can they get a cell phone? If they can get a cell phone, can they get a bank account? If they can get a bank account, can they go to the doctors by themselves? Um, and in Korea, all those answers are no, which we did not know because there's so few people. I was one of eight, uh, eight people in F&B in Korea that was a non-Korean citizen, which is a crazy statistic. Um, and it's, it, the, the fact of the matter is that it's very uncharted territory. Um, in terms of F&B, in terms of getting a visa as a foreigner, all of the foreigners in Korea are either uh, diplomats or teachers or soldiers. And that's really it. It's, it's rare that they issue uh, non-diplomatic visas. So um, we had to figure out that like, oh, it turns out that if you get sick, I have to go to the doctor with you. And it turns out that if, if you want to work, you've got to do it outside of Korea um, because it's a very, very small network and, and people will quickly find out if someone's working outside of uh, the, the realm of their work visa. So what that wound up meaning was, was that no, that was a time when it didn't work out and found out straight away that, look, if, if I can work and you can't work, we're both at great places in our careers. I'm not going to stay in, in Seoul if you can't. Um, so one year in, we made the decision that, hey, after the first year, uh, you do, uh, uh, she had an opportunity to go be functioning head bartender at, at Sweet Liberty, also up for some plates this week. 
Um, and so she moved to Miami for six months while I finished up my responsibilities in Seoul. And then only when we both had the opposite side of the spectrum, which was that we were going to go somewhere that we both knew exactly what we were expecting, uh, which is difficult to arrange for two people at around the same time. So then the, the flip side of that is do your research. Like going from South Korea to China was not a decision that we made lightly. Um, we really wanted to be sure, like, can we both get phones? How is the visa going to work? Can you get paid directly? Is it a direct deposit? Do you get uh, health insurance if something were to go wrong? So there's a whole lot to research. Make a very careful list of questions. We'll talk later about uh, questions to ask your employer, uh, questions that are important to know about your visa and your visa status. But ultimately, it's some of the most important and sometimes awkward conversations to have with an employer. Um, but it's, it's your responsibility to yourself to make a very detailed list of every single thing that you possibly think that you need to know. And gun down on your whoever is sponsoring your visa or whoever is someone on the other side. Make sure that you've spoken to everyone you possibly can about everything you need to know before you pull the trigger and make a decision as much as you can. I'll circle back and say you're going to blow it and you're, we're all going to be, you're going to be surprised, but that's, that's all I want to say about that. And, and I think it's, uh, again, that's why those websites can be interesting. Because, yep. like, for example, Project Visa uh, gives you a lot of information about work permits, a lot, a lot of information about the visitor's visa. So, oh, it's always good. And if it's really far away, you might really want to take some time to go there for a week and see <laughs> yeah. how you feel before just going there and, you know, trying it first and thinking that it's going to be okay. Because so basically, all of us were a bad example for you today. <laughs> <laughs> what we did, don't do it. <laughs> but I know it sounds. That's the thing. That's the that's the beauty of it. It sounds so bad because it's the start. But actually, you know, everybody is still living in this country and and you know in pretty much a successful situation, I would say, because there is very much so a beauty about it. Um, living abroad, like I'm. I feel more French now than I used to, um, and I didn't want to feel French for a long time, but with my accent, there's nothing much I can do. So um, this is something that, you know, I love traveling, and I don't see myself going back to live anytime soon, because I learned so much living abroad and exchanging with everyone. Look, who's, you know, where are you guys from? Who's from Europe here? It's like, like five people. Who's from the US or America? There we go. Um, so this is something that is very difficult for us, um, you know, to, to come and travel and live in the US. But it's as difficult for you, I know, here in the US, but not impossible. Um, and a great example is the fact that um, some of the best bars in Paris are actually run by two Americans and a Colombian woman. Um, so <laughs> this is something also that inspired me like, to put this together because uh, they actually decided to open these places while working in Paris, sometimes illegally. You don't film that. Um, <laughs> but you know, this is not a situation you should really ever be in. So this website will be helping you. Um, learn about the country. Yeah, please. Oh, I just want to circle back and say that was a, a grim little monologue from my side. Now that I'm in Shanghai, I love it in Shanghai. Michaela loves it in Shanghai. Uh, it's one of the best cities to be in the world right now, hands down, uh, maybe number one, although I, I won't say that too loud in America. Uh, but, but it is an incredible experience, and I'm so grateful and, and like happy that I'm living abroad. So even though we stumbled and scraped our knees a lot, absolutely have landed on our feet, and it's like, and amazing. I, I can't stop talking about how amazing it is. So go on. That's, I just wanted, it's a happy rainbow. No, 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 that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect, actually. And um, Nathan, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the visa situation to move here? Yeah, so my situation was my actual second move around. So when I moved to the States, it was a little bit easier. However, prior to moving to the States, you have a long, long, long visa application. So I was offered the job with, um, with the Nomad, which was exceptional um, and really exciting. The problem with it is, is the fact that once you start actually talking to lawyers, which hands down is the single most important thing you'll ever do, whatever you decide to make a move anywhere, make sure that you know your lawyer firsthand, you know them near enough on a personal basis and that you're comfortable speaking to them. They are the most important person throughout the whole process. 
You want to be in contact with them at all times. You want to make sure that they have an understanding of who you are personally, what you've actually done in life, what your goals are, and what your aspirations are, as silly as that sounds, because these people literally have the key to everything in your hands. If they miss out one document, one file, anything like that, the whole visa process can literally be scrapped, started over again in some issues, or you can actually just be denied, and it's a large, large cost. Whenever I started mine, and I'm going to give you the actual numbers to give you an idea about this. Um, Whenever we started ours, I began a process uh, for a visa called an O-1, which is for sec exceptional ability. Now, the O-1 is uh, usually what they give out to people who win Grammys, Oscars, things like that. Um, some of the top models in the world who don't necessarily always stay in the country, but it allows them... <laughs> But they, what, they, what I mean is they, they, they come in and out of the country very quickly, but it allows them then to kind of have a little bit easier of an immigration uh, status when they come in. So it means they have a three-year visa, um, which can be done for one parent company, uh, and it doesn't need to be extended at any point during that three years. It can then, after that, be extended for a further year under the same parent company, or you can uh, change it over and reapply for another three years. But it's basically unlimited. Uh, which is fantastic. However, as a bartender, it's exceptionally, exceptionally difficult to prove that you have any kind of like direction or any kind of ability in life, other than the fact you just make drinks. Um, and everybody that sees it understands that. Every time I go for immigration, that's the first question I get asked. Luckily, my role has a lot more to do with oper the operational side uh, to it and a lot more to do with the creative side. So I started the visa process with an incredible lawyer, um, probably in around April time. Um, and we didn't hear anything until November. Now, whenever my wife uh, was going to apply for hers, she was going to go on what's called a J-1, which is a student visa for the first year, and then we were going to try and work it out and change it over from there. Now, the J-1 is an amazing visa. It's what I actually went out on my internship year uh, to America to study on. And it allows you one year, as long as you have any form of college kind of entry level degree, to be able to go and see what a country's like, like the United States. The, they have parent companies uh, that they set up, which you can actually apply to go and work for. Um, or if you find someone that will sponsor you, it's very, very easily done. The cost of it's around $1,500 for the year. The only thing, difficulties you have is some of the visa companies have exceptions where you have to return home for two years after the visa, and it's a non-extendable visa. So that's fine. We worked around that, and we could figure it out. We knew we had some challenges ahead of us in the first year, but that was fine. We, we knew we were getting in. So I apply for my visa, and I get all the processes in. I get about 14 references from around the world from people who are the, basically the top industry leaders. Um, and to give you an idea, this is pretty scary. So you basically have to write a letter of recommendation based on someone that you know personally. The US government usually reaches out to most of these people to speak to them firsthand to find out what information they know about you, where, they, where you live. Like they ask you how long you've known them for. Can they give them one form of like background information about when you were both together for a meal that you both need to know? because they can bring it up in the interview. So it's quite daunting when there's 14 people and you're trying to like make notes on everything where you guys have been together. And then from there, you do uh, what's called background information. So this basically is any bits of press that you have, you've got to put together in a document. My one ended up at about 1,500 pages. Luckily, I have, over the years, I've kind of amounted some fantastic press. But it needs to be basically in kind of leading um, consumer and also trade pieces, whether this is like the New York Times, the Guardian, the Telegraph. Some really big pieces for them to be able to easily recognize. And what the, the immigration lawyers basically do is they go to Google and they find, and if your name's in the top three people, then that's how they usually select who it's going to be. Uh, from here, then, we submitted the visa. And they told me that it was 15 days, 15 working days before I would hear. Uh, whenever we submitted it, they changed the stipulation uh, like four days before. And we came out of the theater in London thinking that we were going to hear that week. And they basically asked for more information, which was out of nowhere in our $1,500 on top of the visa cost that I'll give you in a second. So we were like, okay, we can work this out. We'll pay that. Another like month and a half goes past, and we don't hear anything. And we're sat in Copenhagen. And at this point, we still don't know whether we're going to apply for Hannah's visa, because I don't know if mine's going to be granted. Uh, my visa cost for the O-1 worked out at about $12,500. So it's not cheap. It's a big investment. Um, and we're sat in Copenhagen, and I get the call that my visa's been accepted, which is incredible. Now that the scary process starts, because now we have to start my wife's visa, and we don't know whether she's going to get hers accepted. So I couldn't get mine, but hers might be denied. Luckily, everything worked out from there. Um, and she got her visa. I flew out about a week later after getting my passport stamped, doing all my interviews at the embassy just to prove who I was. Luckily, my immigration lawyer at the embassy knew um, who Jim Meehan was and had been to PDT and thought it was absolutely incredible that he had actually, um, he was one of the people that was including in my, uh, in my list and asked me what my favorite gin was. Like, they were lovely in the end. So we managed to get out to the States. We moved there in the beginning of October um, in 2015. 
And then after the first year, we started then to look at the second round of visas uh, for my wife. And this is the point when it starts to get really tricky. So you have to start looking at what you're actually going to do. And we started to look at whether she could use her college degree and actual education for what she was actually working in, which luckily she could. So we applied for a visa called an H-1B. And I'm no, like, I, I know a little bit about visas, but I'm not a specialist on them. The H-1B basically is a lottery. And when you apply for it, if they think that you are good enough, they accept you via the lottery to then put, submit your application. Now, to give you an idea, when they started off with this visa, there was about 10,000 people applied for it. Today, there's up to 250,000 people apply for this visa, just for the lottery section to be accepted. They accept anywhere between 15 and 20,000 people each year. And then from there, they whittle it down to like, just over 10. Um, so we got through the first round. The second round then we put in for it and we didn't hear anything then when the visa was submitted up until a month and a half before her visa expired. So we were literally like getting to the point where we were like, okay, we need to start making plans outside of this. this is, there's a real possibility this visa is not going to happen. Uh, we might have to look at other options, whether she went home for a while or how we went around this. Luckily enough, the visa was accepted. Um, she went home, her visa passed out and came back again. And the cost of this one was probably a little bit lower. It was about nine and a half to ten thousand dollars, including all the lawyers' fees. So in the space of a year, including flights, uh, setting up in New York, two visas was probably around the cost of around thirty to forty thousand dollars. You could invest money to buy a property in London. I could have bought a make, property. Uh, make more money yeah. out of it. I, <laughs> like we've we added up over the year that with the cost of it, we probably could have like had a, a substantial down payment towards opening a barn. But well, we probably could have opened a bar in Belfast and a substantial down payment towards opening one in London um, with partnerships. When it comes to the visa process, like it's the easy part is actually like once you're in. The difficult part is actually trying to get accepted. New America, what I found was the most like welcoming country ever, and I absolutely love being here. We both do, but trying to stay here has been like one of the biggest struggles we've ever faced. For anybody that is gonna like really think about moving abroad, the one thing I'll tell you: make sure you go and research every single visa that you can find. Figure out what they are. Figure out what stipulations they have to them, what work like mm. stipulations they have, especially with partners, spouses, family, where you can travel. For instance, if you change over to, from what I'm about to do now, I'm about to change over to a green card, uh, it basically changes for me from a non-immigrant status to an immigrant status. This stops me from traveling from anywhere between three and six months anywhere globally, which is a massive thing considering I'm involved with operations for a, like a to well, for, it's going to become a global hotel company. That's a really, really, really long period where it stops me from working. Well, not working, but traveling with the company. Also, due to my actual role with the company, I travel internationally to do a lot of things such as this in Europe. That stops me from doing all that. So you really need to have an understanding of like where you're going and what you're doing. Second of all, as I said, I can't get this across enough. Make sure whenever you speak to the lawyer, it's someone that you feel comfortable with. I had two lawyers that I had a choice of. One that was working for probably one of the best restaurateurs uh, in America, if not the world. Um, and the other one who was a close friend um, of Leo Robichek, the beverage director. The first one who was working for the big company has this incredible background. She's worked with some of the top people in the world, but I did not feel confident in like the ability. I didn't feel like we had a connection. The emails were like not coming through within like 48 hours. I was waiting like four or five up to a week for emails to come back. And we weren't really like getting a lot of information about what we needed. The second lawyer was someone that was fairly, well, not new, but she was fairly new to doing this. The company had never done my visa or Hannah's before. It was the first time they'd ever sponsored someone from the outside and the first time they'd ever brought somebody into management level um, in the company from outside and not kind of promoted from within. So it was a scary process for them and for us. Um, and we literally like had no idea. We were like the test pilots for like what was going to happen in the future. Uh, luckily, she's incredible. She's worked with us on every single detail possible. And like, even now, I'm in contact with her anytime stuff happens with like the travel ban and all this kind of thing. We're always there with her. Like this year, there was a big scare that um, one of the one of the things that was going to come in with the new president's policies was that he was going to scrap the H-1B because of certain things that are going on with it. Um, like certain countries, such as India, who get a massive allocation to come in, a restriction or restricting other countries, such as the UK and Australia and people aren't happy about this. So they basically um, are underpaying the people that are coming here so other people are losing jobs. And his idea was to scrap the H-1B, which is an absolutely terrifying thing. If you think of anybody that's actually on an H-1B, you wake up that following morning, it's like your visa's no longer there, and you have a role in this like, country, you've got a house, you've got a family, where do you go from there? Um, so really, really have an understanding who your, like, who your visa lawyer is. Secondly, understand the culture and the people. Make sure, like, I luckily traveled to New York five, six times a year before I came here. Understand where you're going. Don't just, like, book a flight to, like, 
somewhere in Asia or somewhere in Europe, like I'm gonna move here just on a whim, it is scary. Trying to find like an apartment, trying to get health insurance, making sure you actually have like the basic necessities to live with um, and just get by in life is a big, big thing. And try to not spend all the money every night when you go out. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Because you need them. Yeah. It's true though, but that again, like once you've sorted all this out and, and it's, it takes some time, I think it takes quite a bit of time mm. to kind of decide that you're going to move up until you actually can make the move happen. I would say probably between six months to a year at least, especially visa involved. But what's very interesting also in what you were saying, Nathan, is the, the fact that you need to make sure you know your lawyer. And again, your lawyer is a counselor, right? You're paying him to give you, well, to process the visa, but ideally you paying him to give you advice, which doesn't mean that he's always going to be right, okay? And which is why it's very important to research like all the different visas you're gonna, you know, you, you can uh, probably apply for, uh, how many of them are accepted each year, Com you know, compare it to the number of people that actually apply for them too, because you're gonna have to have a very, very strong uh, file to be accepted for some of them, right? So it might be easier to move um, with, you know, the H-1B rather than the O-1, depending on what your career has been in the industry. If you've been in industry for two, three years, the O-1 is probably not, if you were moving to the, to the US, for example, from Europe or from anywhere else, it would probably be a bit more complicated um, to reach this one. Another thing with the lawyers, they, so anybody that's actually worked with lawyers before, they are literally like salespeople. They're, they're amazing. They'll like undercut each other and then you'll have other people who be like, I can do it super cheap for you. Um, and it's not always the way to go. Like every time that I spoke to people who were like offering it super cheap, I was like, have you done this, this, this before? Like, yeah, 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 don't worry, like super like blase about it. The other thing, how you know you've got a good lawyer is they have connections to um, different boards. So with mine, they're actually working with like um, the actual travel connections. So there's actual, actual boards of lawyers who basically consult um, for like big firms. So if they don't know the information, they can reach out to these people um, and gain the knowledge of it. And it literally happens like almost instantly when you're sat in the office. So if you have questions, they call up other lawyers who can then consult with them. This was a massive thing that I found was like some of the, the lawyers who were not as experienced didn't have this, um, this actual connection to be able to do this. The lawyer that I have right now is absolutely amazing. She is involved in everything that was happening with the travel ban, so half of her clients um, were obviously affected by this, and large businesses not necessarily in the same kind of industry that we're in. But they, they had like big fears whether they, their family could travel in and out. Most of these people are like global uh, directors of companies. So they, she consulted on a lot of the things for them to make sure that they were able to get around and actually continue living life as normal. And this is like one of the major important aspects is anytime anything happens, I give her a call and I'm like, do I need to travel with my travel documents? She's like, yes, bring your wedding certificate, make sure you've got your file. And I travel all the time now with just my actual visa, just as like a backup if anything goes wrong that I have everything. All my lawyer's notes are in there, so that way then if they need to call her, like she's on call all the time. How was the, how, how expensive was the visa when you moved to uh Definitely. Asia. Um, yeah, I, I'd say three things about that is one, I work and Proof and Company works with a lot of uh, international global hotel groups. So when I went, it was with Four Seasons. Proof is currently working with 23 of the world's Four Seasons to redo their bar programs. Um, so that includes placement of head bartenders. So this process is something that we, we go through a whole lot. We're working right now on uh, Bellagio, Bulgari, Accor, Capella, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Rosewood, et cetera. Um, so one thing that is a reality when you join a major global hotel corporation, uh, such as, as Four Seasons, let's say, is that um, just make sure that it's in your contract and it, it likely will be a line in your contract that they're going to cover uh, the cost and responsibility of your visa, including the cost of a lawyer, including everything. So for me, it was zero cost to myself. Um, that was part of our agreement from the get-go, was that they were going to arrange a lawyer, they were going to use someone that they have contact with, um, any, any Four Seasons or Rosewood or, or Bellagio's or these kinds of hotel groups are going to have uh, usually an international GM international director of food and beverage, an international chef, uh, maybe an international sous chef if they have different restaurants, let's say. Uh, hotel managers probably international as well. So anyone that's in a, a core 
one of these global corporations, as part of their internal hotel policies, is that they usually rotate senior staff between properties every two to three years as part of their own internal development program. So if you're, let's say, on track to become a Four Seasons general manager one day, what they're going to do is every two to three years, they rotate you to a different country, usually, if not different city. Um, and so every two to three years, you're moving. By the time it's your fifth or sixth property, you're then 10 to 15 years into that process. And then you're ready to become a general manager. The thought is that you've seen pretty much all the things that the world's going to throw at you. Yeah. All, all the places you've you've held chairman's raging party in the karaoke room and gotten them cup o noodle at 2 a.m. at 7-eleven you know you've had uh, the sick guest who uh, only speaks one language and you got to figure it out so that's you know that's part of their deal but hey part of the reality of that situation is that um, these are companies that are constantly in the process of applying for and succeeding at achieving visas for people um, so what that means is just make sure that that it's your employer's responsibility, and, and in my opinion, it should be your employer's responsibility to uh, make sure that these costs are covered as their investment in you as a senior member of their uh, team. And if, if they weren't interested in covering the costs of your visa, they, they, they I, to me, it's, a, it's, I'm not talking about your situation. Uh, <laughs> um, for an international hotel, if they're not covering the cost of your visa, to me, it's a statement about what they're saying about your value in their team. Um, and so, in my opinion, that's that's something that that's definitely a part of their responsibilities as a, as an investment in a long-term team member. Hey, on the back end of that, however. I signed a clause in my contract that was, if I leave before the end of two years, I have to pay back a prorated cost of what it costs to move me out, including plane tickets, including hotel, including uh, you know the international moving company, including the cost of lawyer's visa, et cetera. Um, it being the case that my wife had her situation in Korea, and so we left it a year and a half, I had to pay back 25% of that cost, which I think was very fair um, because I, I should have been there for two years, but just due to, hey, look, I'm, I'm not going to live in a different country than my wife does long term. So I moved and paid the money, and that's fine. Um, but a second thing about what you, what you said that I thought was very uh, interesting and important is you guys, when you go to get a visa, understand that you're in a uh, you're going through a bureaucratic government process. And uh, as a bureaucratic government process, it means the laws, regulations, and understandings of the world outside of their building are very limited. <laughs> They're very limited, if not non-existent. So they have limited understanding of what it means to be a bartender. So even though in your mind, you're like, dude, I know how to run 12 outlets. I ran six bars for my last whatever. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to provide a very real value. I'm going to make these guys a ton of money. And uh, we're going to have a successful business together. How, if the government's not going to necessarily see that because in any country you go to around the world, they're like, bartender equals bartender equals, like, you know, I can pour you know, tonic and gin together, so I don't understand what your value add is. And so even though we know as a group of people that have worked really hard and lots of years, I'm sure every single person in this room is capable of opening, you know, uh, uh, three bars in a major hotel next month if you really had to. The, 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 the government's not going to see that. So what's important is stating your case, all right? So if this is something you're thinking about, then you should start gathering press, start gathering things on paper. What is, what is it that really makes you special? How are you going to sell it to some dude who like, you know, works in a government clerk office stamping papers all day that you're really special? Because it's, it's literally down to that guy at the end of the day. Special, not special. Worth it, not worth it. Is this a job that you're taking from one of the people in my country? Uh, or are you bringing something and you're bringing some value in education that's going to help my country over time? Are you going to train the next 10 people who can do your job in other hotels? Or, or hotels, restaurants, bars, whatever. Or are you just coming to like party and leech? So for you, it's, it's about like, do, do bar smarts, do bar five day, do uh, uh, um, the, 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 the bar in Portland. Uh, to, <laughs> hey, it's optical. Uh, <laughs> to, but do, you know, uh, uh, it's copyright. Uh, <laughs> So do, do all that, but make sure that you save all your paperwork, make sure that you log it, make sure it's filed, uh, and, and start to really build a case for yourself because there will come a day when you have to say like, hey, here it is on paper, you know, college degrees are going to 
pay play a part. Uh, you may have to have, uh, it, it's sometimes like in China, for example, the visa process is out of like a 200 point score and, and degree yes or no is 50 points of that, which may not be fair. However, in China, a lot of people work under the table anyway, so you know, it doesn't really matter. Like to, to, give you, to give you a quick idea, I know at the minute that they're having, a lot of the lawyers are having problems with like the London Embassy uh, for the United States. On one of the friends of ours who is a sous chef at a Freestar Michelin restaurant, um, applied for his visa, they asked for further information, he supplied everything. This dude has worked in like some of the top places in the world for the past like 15 years, and they turned around and told him that he's not qualified enough to do the job that he's doing. And that's terrifying. And they literally, anybody that they see, like bartender, they just see Tom Cruise. That's yep. it. What are you doing here? You mean nothing to me. And it, it, the hospitality and all honesty, and everybody that I've spoken to has said this is the hardest, hardest place for you to go anywhere in your career was when you're dealing with visa lawyers. Hospitality is the worst industry for them to see because they don't see it as a real career or as a, as a path for them to like bring into the country. So you have a lot more to prove than people who are in finance, people who are in tech, anything like that. That's why your case has to be so strong, why it comes down to lawyers, but also understanding the reasons why you're going there. Because you need to be able to explain that. When you're in front of those lawyers, they're going to grill you as to what you're doing here, why you want to be in this country, and what you're going to bring to it. And they ask you every single time you come back as well, so it doesn't get any easier. And then you have to, <laughs> yeah, right. you have to go yeah, through immigration exactly. every time. <laughs> um, just a quick one before we move to the next point. My World Abroad, uh, which is the number four down the, the website you have, is specifically dedicated to North Americans. So that might be the one uh, that is interesting for you if you want to make a move abroad as well. Um, there is a, just a small survey. It's a free uh, website, uh, but you just need to fill up a small survey and then it gives you all the information and everything. Your um, cocktail? Can I tell them about the cocktail? Of again? course you can. Oh. Uh, so the, the yellow glass in front, I totally forgot <laughs> to talk about it. We were having so much fun talking about visas. Uh, is, so this, this yellow cup that you got in front of you is... Um, uh, also inspired by the shame chef, it's called Oops, I Forgot to Submit My Seminar Cocktail Recipe. Uh, and it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's called the Turin Turismo. Uh, it's called the Turin Turismo. So I, I love a vodka martini with things in it. Um, so uh, Poet's Dream is one of my favorite cocktails. So is a turf, uh, turf club number two. Um, although those are gin cocktails, but made with vodka, they're equally delicious. So this is Grey Goose with a little bit of Benedictine and Strega and orange bitters. Uh, it is one that we put together in Four Seasons Seoul. Um, originally, it was a different recipe. But one of the things that we'll talk about later is to know which of the ingredients that you're used to working with and you're putting in your master menu that you're about to export into a foreign country are or are not legal. Uh, so I had a whole bunch of menus written on Excel and already figured out before I moved to Seoul, South Korea. And then when I moved there, I realized that like, bitters are illegal and like uh, uh, there's only two vermouths and uh, luckily we can still get uh, Grey Goose and all the delicious products in your portfolio. Uh, but but um, there, were, there was a bunch of stuff that was, that was missing and um, it took us the next year to bring in Korea's first Pisco, to have a tequila that was over 38% 30, alcohol, um, to have it was tincture bitters. Angostura just became legal three weeks ago in Seoul, South Korea, um, after that hotel being open for two years. Um, so it just goes to show you, it, well, most bars are fine because they suitcase it in. Um, but if you're working in a hotel, you are also subject to the hotel's local hygiene department and, and health department who's going to make sure that you don't break any internal rules, including pouring illegal substances such as tincture bitters. Uh, so anyway. Delicious cocktail, I'm glad to share it with you today. Thanks, Chris. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left and, uh, and, quite, a bit of <laughs> and quite a bit to cover. Um, but, you know, obviously once you've sorted all this out, which is obviously the biggest part of it, um, you're going to need to make the move. Um, and really, the idea is that you already got a plan in place, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So I'm going to let Ago tell us a little bit about um, the way I approach this, because you kind of had to adapt to a new culture, you had to learn a new language, pretty quickly, I would say, because you were kind of running a bar. Um, you know, you were left running the bar like this. So how was, how was it and how did you manage to kind of get through on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, you really need to be kind of, uh, 
I know for me, was was uh, the approach was different because I didn't have all the all the stress for the visas in the beginning. So for me, it was kind of really following my my dream a little bit, which is something always to to keep awake. So of course, we need to organize ourselves. You need to know the place where you're going to live to, understand the cost of life, and uh, the visa process. But as well, you need to you need to feel that you are happy. So you need to feel that you're following your dreams and uh, are you going to do something that you're going to love it. And that what was really I think the thing that uh, that driven me to to on daily basis wake up and uh, eat uh, just bread and butter, the English bread, <laughs> that those were in the back, and um, and go to work and try and try to try to make it for myself. Go around places, meeting people, go to lab, go to milk and honey, go to all those places where they were inspiring people working there and try to, to understand just watching them and be on the side and, uh, and observe how, how other people do it. And it's quite, it's, it can be really difficult as well, I guess, because like you, when you come from a small place, for example, in Italy, because that's where you, that's no, where no, you but were then from. You see other people that are super successful, they're organized, mm -hmm. they do this one, they do that one, you are a very small fish that uh, mm -hmm. you are lost. And you need to stay with yourself. You need to dedicate time to yourself and, uh, and uh, cultivate your passion, which are outside work as well. If you like to do sport, you keep on doing that. You always, you always need to cut time out of the business life to, to think about you. If you like photography, if you like sport, if you like reading, if you, whatever you like, if you like driving a sports car, whatever it is, needs to be a priority in your daily routine that you need to keep on focus on. Otherwise, you end up to, to get distracted sometime and, uh, and lose what, what is the purpose of, of you. And it's, I mean, it's really important also um, to kind of try and adapt. It can be really tricky. Uh, I came from a really small village in the southwest of France, and then the first time I actually moved to Paris um, to work in cocktail bars, I didn't really know anyone. Um, I, I had to take public transport, can you imagine? I know, I know yeah. Same. There's no, there's no traffic light in my village. No, we used to. You, have, you, have <laughs> the, you, you, go out, you go out to the house, you have the car, you go to the gym, and from the gym you go to work, and from work you go party, and from party you go home. I went to London to take buses, <laughs> tube. <laughs> no, it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. It was February. It was uh, the coldest winter in the last uh, 15 years, probably. And, uh, you know, for, uh, for a small Italian dude that used to be car, work, work, car, being outside in the cold and taking public transport, it was, uh, it was quite something. I don't want to seem delicate, but it's a, it's a big switch. <laughs> It's a big switch. You are uh, you are out there, you know, and uh, and try to understand the new system, and uh, it was was really overwhelming for me. But how did you guys manage to build your your circle once you moved to London or once you moved to Asia? Um, my one's hilarious because whenever I got to New York, uh, we had like credit rating in the UK. We had, did really really well. We'd set up finances. Our bank accounts were all in check. And you get to New York, and I couldn't even open a bank account. Um, <laughs> I had to go and get a social security number, which was interesting because the social offices are absolutely awful and one of the worst places you'll ever spend a whole day. And then you finally get all those details and the bank account's like, okay, do you have credit in the US? And you're like, no, I've got credit in the UK with like, for instance, HSBC, which is a global banking company. You think you can walk into an HSBC in the United States? No, because the financial um, division in the United States is completely separate to anywhere else in the world. So it doesn't count for anything. So it took almost two years for us to build up credit before they would allow us to have a credit card. Um, you then have such things as health insurance. In the United States, is your employer going to provide health insurance? A lot of people that I know that came here, quite a few illegally throughout the years, never had health insurance. And then whenever they were injured, ran up huge health bills. Um, I spent a night in hospital last year where it was like $10,500. Luckily enough, the company that I work for has amazing health insurance, which covers us. But if not, it's like six to eight hundred dollars a month. It can cost up to you to live with health insurance, which you would never think about. Because in the UK, you have the the National Health Service, so health insurance is completely free. You just walk into a doctor and you see one that day. So these are all like small details that you just don't even realize. Sure. Um, and 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 
uh, just, to, just to piggyback on that idea of health insurance, I know even if you have health insurance, each country is going to be different, right? So like in Singapore, even if you're insured, um, it's, it's so expensive to see a doctor. A lot of people, they just go to Vietnam, like if they have to go, which sounds crazy, like <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, but, um, no, they, but even if you want to go see a dentist or something, people just fly out to get a cavity filled and it's cheaper with the cost of a round trip flight plus a hotel stay plus uh, going to the dentist. It's cheaper overall, even if you're insured in Singapore to see someone with your insurance. So like, hey, every country is going to be very different. Every city is going to be very different in terms of your expectations. Um, getting settled is, is uh, especially in China, which is very bureaucratic in terms of the overall governmental systems you can't um so like you check into a hotel you got to get a temporary hotel card so then that's a per temporary residence permit that then allows you to get a cell phone which allows you to get a bank account once you get those three things then you can turn around and start looking for an apartment once you get an apartment you can turn around and start applying for your work permit uh well no then you can then you can f uh, finalize your uh, work visa process because in that time you're actually on a temporary visa. So then you apply for a, 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 a longer term work visa, which you have to send your passport away. So your passport's gone for weeks. You can't travel. Um, they give you a little piece of paper that you have to hold on to for dear life. Uh, and then once you get your passport back, then you can apply for your work permit, which then starts the cycle again. Then once you have all of those things in place, then you're allowed to begin the process of shipping your things from whatever the original port was. So the, the shipping company won't even talk to a Chinese port to begin to load a shipping container with your stuff until you have every single piece of paper done. So it was about a five and a half month process to get our like <laughs> anything beyond what was in our suitcases into China. It's finally there now, thank goodness. Um, but then, yeah, man, in terms of just what do you do when you're here, you got a new language, you got a new job, um, it's exciting. In, in Asia, look, in Asia, the, the expat communities are, everybody's in the same boat. Same as it is, you know, I'm sure in New York or London, only there it's like, everyone's not Chinese and there's some people you can pick them out in a crowd who aren't Chinese uh, and and so they tend to grav gravitate together and so the reality is in in whether it's Korea whether it's China whether it's Japan all of which I've lived in whether it's like Singapore Vietnam etc cetera, etc cetera, um, you've got a group of people there who are awesome the, the international communities when you get to East Asia are so cool and the reason why is because one Everybody's just trying to like be your friend. Nobody wants to see you fail. It, where it's, it's a couple people in a small boat very far away from our collective homes. Two is everyone's interesting. Like nobody just like wakes up in Shanghai one day. Like everyone there has, they got like a story to tell, you know, like, like uh, uh, pirates on a pirate ship. Like we're all somewhere like this kind of band of, of misfits very literally in the country where we live. So, uh, and, and number three is, is everyone like, you know, you've got, you've got like, it's not like pub quiz where there's, there's 30 pubs that you have your choice of going to. There's like a very small handful of places with activities for international population. And so when you go there, it's like, you see all your friends. It's like, you know, the cheers bar where everybody's like, oh man, it's so good to see you. What have you been up to? How's blah, blah, blah. Everyone's learning a foreign, foreign language at the same pace. So there's like this, this like half Chinese pseudo slang that people use, uh, where it's like the first few phrases that you learn in your Chinese class. And, and so you, people like have this way of bonding to each other. Um, and it's really cool. Like when you move to Asia, it's one thing to move a, like around Europe or from Europe to the Americas or whatever, because you're kind of like, you're an insider until you're discovered to be an outsider. What I mean by that is like, when I go to Netherlands, for example, uh, I'll just walk into a cafe and I sit down and you have this, no one's like staring at you, you're not out of place, you're just another like, could be a Dutch person, who knows, until they come over and they're like, rah, 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 and then you're like, hey man, I don't. <laughs> it's a good impression. <laughs> That's, hey, I do my best, you know. <laughs> Uh, and you're like, hey man, I don't talk like that, but I'm happy to have a cof coffee. Uh, <laughs> and, and you do your best. Um, but there's, there's a, when you go to Asia, when you go to Asia, you realize there's a very different reality, which is that 
uh, you're an outsider until you're discovered to be an insider. So people look at you and you're like, anyway, it, it, unless, you, unless you look Chinese, let's say, or Japanese or, or Korean in one of those countries, you have an experience that is, it can be quite isolating because even like the guy on the street who's handing out coupons to come to his bar or restaurant and is like, hey, come in, we got two for one specials, whatever, they won't even talk to you because they, they say, no, they, they don't talk to you, they don't look at you because what's the point? Like, you're just gonna be another foreigner who doesn't speak my language, you're not gonna come to the restaurant anyway, if you did, you'd be totally lost. And you can understand how that, how someone, it's not like, a racist view or something, it's a very practical way of looking at your environment, which is just foreigners are here to do foreigner stuff, and I'm here, you know, the, the real world that we live in are people who look like us, and that's okay. Um, I, don't, I don't judge that, but it is something that you have to get used to as part of that reality. And then if and when you do speak the language in East Asia, uh, Singapore is very different because it's, it's basically Dubai, it's just like a bunch of foreigners hanging out. Uh, it's true. <laughs> Um, but if you get to, by that I mean Aussies, uh, when you get to, uh, when you get to like East Asia where there's the foreigners are very few and far between. Um, in Shanghai there's a lot, but like there's some places I go to in China, I might walk around all day and not see another non-Chinese person. Um, and so, and even when I open my mouth and Chinese comes out, uh, you know, which I've studied for seven years, um, when when Chinese comes out, people then you have this Groundhog Day experience where everyone, the first thing says, whoa, that's crazy, how do you speak that? And blah, 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 and you're like, okay, here we go again, you know, and like, and so you can never, you never really, there's this surface level conversation that you have over and over again. It's like if you were a horse who spoke English and you turn around and you're like, hey man, how are you today? And they're like, what, can you do that? And you're like, I'm a horse, but it's crazy, I've been studying it for seven years. And this is, but that's kind of like the weird, I don't know if that's a good explanation or not. Uh, that martini was delicious I feel, though. And, uh, yeah. I, I hey. feel you though, every day that's how I feel. So. Well, but that's it, so, so uh, the, the, the long-winded point that I'm trying to make is that you've got some different realities that you can expect. And one is that sometimes you're gonna be in a, maybe it's a place you've been to New York a bunch of times, but it still is, there's all this stuff you're yet to discover and it's really on you to figure it out. You know, maybe you've come from a small town to a large town and there's some things that are surprising. Maybe you come totally from the West into, or you know, all the way from Japan into, into the States, right? And you have no idea, but people are gonna treat you differently one way or the other and it's, it's on you to find balance to continue to pursue things that excite you and to keep a pulse on that because culture shock comes in waves. It's like a 10 step process and it takes time and you need to be patient with yourself and stay focused. Uh, and, but at the end, it's so fruitful. I think we're all grateful that we live where we do. Definitely, definitely. And again, you know, it's all about asking the right question, I think throughout, um, specifically once you're there, like we all hang out in bars just as you know, the bartenders, it's pretty simple. How is the day-to-day -day life? Like, how can I actually get this or, or that? And that's very important. We've got only a couple of minutes left. Troubleshooting, I think we've talked about quite uh, intensively. <laughs> and please, make the move. Just take the chance, really. I think that's, that's all about taking the opportunity. But if you had, like, one last, um, you know, piece of advice that you would give, Nathan, what would it be? Uh, don't be afraid. Yeah. Just actually do it. Uh, the more you think about it, the more complicated it becomes. Uh, only thing, as I say, make sure you know your like legal applications to get there. Uh, but definitely do it. You will learn so much from the cultural background and from like the opportunities that will arise, and also like the failures. That's the the biggest part. How you can turn those around and turn them into successes. For me, check my Facebook page. Uh, if you, <laughs> we we are currently recruiting for a couple different uh, couple different positions internationally. And I strongly recommend that you check it out. Uh, I've got head bartender positions in Kuala Lumpur, uh, uh, a couple different cities in China, and um, soon to be Indonesia as well. Uh, that having been said, just just you know, keep on keeping on. <laughs> Agu, well, you see a lot of uh, influential people out there, not only in the bar industry, which. Uh, you think that uh, perhaps they were born in a rich family and uh, they made success or they were lucky for any reason. But then when you hear the story, they were nobody. So this is uh, very inspirational for me when you look up at those, uh, those persons and, uh, and you realize that uh, you really need to believe in what you do. 
and just don't be afraid, as, as we say, just keep, uh, keep on driving your passion and uh, you need to, to wake up in the morning and make sure that you like what you do. And, and that's, you know, that's the important point, really, and that's the idea of it. Um, it is, you know, a lot of work, but I, on a day-to-day -day basis, we all put on the hours. It's exactly the same. That's going to be life-changing if you make a move. Is it, is, it, is it what you do on yourself? Is it personal work? Exactly. So it's, it, and yeah, that's, that's the thing. You know, it's, it's all about discovering new part of yourself, I guess, new parts within uh, your craft. And this is a very important step in your life sometimes. I mean, I've lived abroad for the last, I don't know, like 10 over 10, 12 years. Um, and I love it, really. Like every time I come back home, I'm happy to be home. I'm happy to see the family. But, you know, I don't think I could leave home for a little bit longer. Well, but you can too many French around. Too many, right. French, too many French people over there. Uh, the country is filled up with them. Like, incredible. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, this is this is a very important step that you could take. Um, just don't take it lightly, and I'm sure you understand that already. Um, and we hope we kind of gave you a bit of information. We could talk like this probably, and you probably notice for another an hour and a half, probably three hours, probably be there all day, um, which we don't really necessarily all want to do. But um, this is you know, what we had to say. And guys, you've got anything to add to this? Are we uh, good? Definitely do, do it. Definitely do it. It's amazing. It. It's, it's such a blessing to, to live somewhere, uh, somewhere internationally. I've been doing it for five years now in Asia. Uh, I wouldn't take a single day back as, as high as the highs have gone and, and as low as the lows can be. And it's, it's going to be a lot of stress sometimes, but the successes are so worth it. And it's such an adventure. And you're, you're not going to do it unless you do it. And, and there's a lot to that, as you've heard today, but I, I can't recommend it anymore. Um, Shanghai, I, I can't wait to be back there. It's, it's an incredible place to live, and uh, I just feel really lucky. So that's all. Do you guys have any questions for us? Yes. Uh, the idea of moving with the opportunity and then moving to find the opportunity. Good question. So I know you moved, you had the opportunity to mm -hmm. merchant. You were very lucky. Right off the back, going from Philly to New York. Sure. Having the job opportunity in Shanghai, right? It's all. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tackle some of this in the beginning if that's sure. okay. Uh, so the, the question is, is do you move to find an opportunity or do you move before an opportunity? I, uh, I was very lucky at first that I, I had Booker and Dax coming into uh, New York with Momofuku. I found that on Craigslist. Um, what I can say definitely though is that had I not had that opportunity, eventually I would have just moved to New York because even as you look like the, the way people recruit in these major cities and these major markets is they're like, shit, we need a bartender. Like, do you know a bartender? Do you know a bartender? Do you know a bartender? And he's like, yeah, yeah I got a guy. And then he comes in and that's it. Like, it's not a, a, something that goes out. You'd never see it if you're farther away. So if you really want to succeed in that sense in a major city, just got to go and like meet the people. And I was happy you know, uh, uh, I, I was, I remember writing an email to Sean Horde when he was back at PDT and just saying like, hey man, like you don't know who I am, but I'd mop the floors and just like, but you know, he never wrote me back because it was a weird email. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 uh, Look, ultimately, ultimately, I, I definitely recommend it. However, there's sometimes that that's not possible, right? Like an international hotel job or an international restaurant group, they're going to do their recruiting like seven, eight months before the grand opening. So it depends. I think there's a lot of nuance there. If you're just talking about a major city and if it's possible to like visit ahead of time and, and put some feelers out, I think that's very strong. People are going to trust people they can look in the eye. So if, if you're applying over Facebook or something, you know, there's a whole... I it, think you, you should look for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't wait for it. As a, as a Chris, I receive, I don't know how many messages a day uh, from Italian bartenders. Hey, Iago, my friend of a friend, you know, because uh, za, 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 whatever. Uh, I would like to move to London. You have any suggestion for me? Can you tell me when something is available? Yeah. I don't reply. Because for me, it's the wrong attitude already. Yes. You should buy the ticket flight, very cheap as well nowadays. You can fly very easily. Come to London, feel it, come to the bar, show the face. So you show me your attitude. And then if we can help, we are very happy within our establishment or to other people that we know that uh, 
you are suitable for them. So you should go and look for the opportunity out there, whatever it is, if it's abroad, in your own city, whatever it is. Lorenzo Antonori, his story always gets me from the American bar at the Savoy, where he came in, he was like kind of helping out at a distillery in Mexico. He was like, I really want to, man, my dream is just to work at the Savoy. He just had this in his vision. So what he did is he, he bought a plane ticket, he came in, he had enough money for one suit, he, he, he bought a disc, he, he put on the suit, he bought a discount briefcase, nothing inside, and <laughs> nothing inside, and went in and just sat the, sat the bar, and, and the guys were there, and he just sat and had a cocktail, and he was like, you know, the guy was, oh, you know, who are you? He said, oh, my name is Lorenzo Antinori, I, I really, you know, I'd love to have a job here, at, uh, sorry, to do the <laughs> accent. Uh, so, <laughs> it's actually perfect. <laughs> love to have a job here at Savoy Hotel. Uh, and, and they said, you know what? We were talking in the back. We love your suit. When can you start? And he was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here in next week. Uh, and, and then he did it. He did it from there. <laughs> it's the best I can do. I'm sorry, man. Uh, but, but I think it's so inspiring though, because he, he came, he had no clue what was going to happen and he just went for it. And there's something to be said about that kind of sand that someone can just walk in, not know what's going to happen and just be like, I'm here. If you can take me, I'm happy to mop the floors in the back and I can start tomorrow, you know? That's a good one. And again, if you are about to do the Facebook message, um, just make sure there's nothing on your Facebook that you would regret Please. them seeing. <laughs> Please do it. Um, I don't really recruit a lot of people anymore, but when I used to, um, Facebook was not that bad, but it started to become it. But I've heard some stories from this guy that were pretty scary. Uh, but it's, and it's fairly easy, but again, think about it. I was sitting in a presentation the other day from Jacob Breyers. Once it's on the internet, it's on the internet and it's never gonna leave. So just make sure that, you know, you, if you don't want it to be on the internet, it's never, yeah, don't do it, or it's never, you if, know. If you're applying for something international, take 15 minutes Take yourself seriously and clean up your social media. Like, in all seriousness, I cannot tell you the dozens and dozens of CVs that I've gotten for people who want to apply for, like, bar director of a seven F&B outlet in a, in a national, you know, in a, in a global hotel. And you go, what's someone going to look at? If you're applying internationally, if they can't look you in the eyes, what's someone going to look at? They're going to look at your Facebook. And what's, what are they going to see? It's you pouring a layback, or it's you like just being a knucklehead, or, or you doing some, some posts that's, that's something other than what that company would project. Really take it seriously. Make a LinkedIn if you don't have one. People are going to look. And that's, that's the impressions that we get. That's all. Again, um, I think we need to wrap up. Thank you very much for coming. We hope we... Uh... Thank you, Art. I go, Nathan. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. The dog, thank you very much for coming, too. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Enjoy responsibly. Thank you. Mm -hmm.